OK, so we're in there. OK, so let me go back to this. OK. Screen share. And then sound too. OK, so let me go back over here. All right, everybody. Hey, this is the Sunday collab. Today I'm presenting and I just had you know 10 minutes of amazing stuff and I totally forgot to record it uh, just a little stressed out um, next week's collab is going to be a discussion on this week's collab so all the links and everything else will be um, on the YouTube video once I get it onto the think collab for the featured video for this week and then all the links will be there if people want to study those links and kind of come up with their own observations and then join us next week for the discussion um, anyway, I was just kind of talking about how um, that I'm putting work together um, because I'm angry at a lot of people using intellectual property for healing machines and things like that, especially sound healing, because this kind of stuff has been around since the world became solid. So when the seven nations were originally came here and they developed the world energetically, they overlapped and layered themselves and this world became physical. And then the original people came here. They were taught, you know, things like somatics. They were taught how to use sound and vibrations and a lot of the um, work and also how to imprint this stuff into, right, reflect it. We were talking about Steiner's work and how it's our job to reflect good things and feelings onto the mineral kingdoms in order for to help their evolution in the future as well into more um, conscious beings. So a lot of this stuff, the imprinting, the reflecting, um, and all of the stuff that humans are supposed to be responsible for to do, which we don't do, um, this is all stuff that was taught to original people and this information and knowledge. And so people don't own the rights. Also, I don't really like the whole idea that people have, you know, I, I don't like the idea that people have authority, especially over things like health and the environment, you know, when people have supplements and, and they get around actually growing the food, which is the medicine, growing the plants, which is the medicine, which each individual can do so that you're not stuck in this financial mess of having to buy this stuff. And also when it comes to a lot of healing machines that are, you know, starting to come out along with sound healing and a lot of this other stuff that you have to go to somebody. So I'm going to put some information out that talks about how this stuff has been working for a lot longer than, than these people who claim to have intellectual property over some of these ideas and thoughts, philosophies, and mechanical technology. And a lot of this stuff is already in our world. Okay, thank you, Lenny, for reminding me that I wasn't recording. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots of hurdles that I'm trying to go through right now. So, okay, so the first thing that I want to do is I actually want to talk about, um, this is an article, a lecture that Steiner gave that's called The Elemental World and the Future of Mankind. So I'm, I'm going to be putting all these links up. Um, and then I want to get down to... Um, Let's see. And so uh, I'm just going to go down to where he's talking about the different elements. Okay, thus in solid element, live spiritual beings of elemental kind who are very much more clever than human beings, even a person of extreme astuteness intellectually is no match for these beings who are super sensitive entities, live in the realm of the solid earth. One could say that just as man consists of flesh and blood, so do these beings consist of cleverness, of super cleverness. Another of their particularities is that they prefer to live in multitudes. When one is in a position to find out how many of these astute beings a subtle earth object contain, then one can squeeze them out as if like a sponge into the spiritual sense, of course, and out they flow in an endless stream. But counting these gnome-like beings is a difficult task. If one tries to count them as one would cherries or eggs, i.e. one, two, three, as soon notices that they will not be counted that way. 
when one reach say three then they would suddenly a lot more so counting them as one would on the physical plane is no use nor is any other form of calculation for they immediately play tricks on you suppose one put two on the other side and two on the other in order to say that twice makes four one would be wrong um, it must be acknowledged that the intellect, intellect development by man in recent times is very impressive, but these super intellectual beings show a mastery over intellect even where it is merely a question of numbers. The elemental beings in fluid element, i.e. water, have particular developed what is in man his life of feeling and sensitivity. In this respect, we humans are really backward compared to these beings. We may take pleasure in ro red rose or feel enchanted when the trees unfold their foliage, but these beings go with the fluid, which as sap rises in the rose bush and participate in the redness of the blossoms. In an intimate way, they share feelings in the world processes. We remain outside of things with our sensitivity, whereas they are right inside the processes themselves and share in them. The elemental beings of air have developed to a high degree what lives in the human will. It is splendid that the analytic chemist discovers the atomic weight of hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and that he finds out how hydrogen and oxygen combine in the water to further analyze or else how to chloride of lime is analyzed and so on. But the element of spiritual beings are active behind all this and it is essential that man should acquire insight into the characteristics. During the period which man developed his intellect, as already mentioned, this was a form of the first third of the 15th century to the end of the ninth century. These elemental beings were pushed to one side, as it were, while the intellect played a creative part in man's cultural life, there was not much they could do. And because the elemental beings dwelled in, sol in the solids had in certain sense to hold back and leave the intellect of man. They also held back the beings of water and air but now we live at a time where the intellect has begun to decline within the civilized world. It is failing, it is failing into decadence. If mankind does not become receptive to what streams towards him from the spiritual, spiritual world, then the result of this dullness on man's part will be, there, will be, there are signs already of this happening. And these elemental beings will gather together to form a certain union and place themselves under the leadership of the supreme intellectual power, which he calls a hiraman. And a hiraman is very dark forces and energies, and they're the energies that are used by the Dark Brotherhood, basically, when Steiner talks about this stuff. So um, we're kind of in a place because we're not using these energetic systems right for you know um with all the relationships which were ways of communicating healing recovering you know restructuring um shape shifting you know utilizing a lot of these elementals elements and elemental beings and this is what's really i believe is operating behind when we use things like cymatics right that vibrate the air and vibrate the water we also have to realize like in india um, and other languages arabic aramaic and sanskrit that the reason why they call those the languages of light is because when they're spoken <coughs> properly they actually are like cymatics to the air and they actually vibrate things into geometrical structures and patterns which for me kind of sorts out all these beings and brings them into one place you know combines them um, like ingredients in a cake and keeps them um, helps them in the dreaming world in the energetic fields um, to help us to move forward in creating new patterns and structures right 
vibrationally, energetically, which also can help us to heal, you know, in our own bodies and heal the soil and everything else. So now I want to go to a video. I kind of have these laid out a little bit, but not too much. And I like this video. This will be on the link too. So here we go. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Okay. Are you ready? Let me know if you can hear it. All right. Can you hear it? Nothing yet. Well, it might not play the sound, but you can watch the video. Can you see the video, Lenny? No, the only thing I see is Gord. Oh. Crud. Okay, hold on. Let me go back here. Oh, because I have it on the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Um, start sharing. Okay, here we go. Hold on one second. Let me go over here. Okay, can you see my video now? No? Can you oh, guys I see that take video? That pitch. Right, but can you see the video from the pitch? Yes. Okay. Well, then I'll turn the volume down. Hold on. Let me see how I can turn the volume down. So I'm sharing. So. Oh, you know what? I can turn the volume down on the video. Hold on one second. Okay, so these are different sounds, right? Tones right that are changing the geometrical structure they have salt on a black disc and so they have the tones that are reflecting the black disc and shaping them so different hertz sounds frequencies we could call them frequencies or sounds so i just kind of wanted to show this for just a couple minutes to kind of give us a visual you know of you know, we've got a salt here. They're using salt kind of as a visual element and then using the tones and frequencies to change the elemental, um, you know, forces within the, which helps to not train them, the elemental forces, but maybe utilize them in specific ways, um, you know, to, I keep, this word keeps going past my head um, to get them to, you know, congregate together, pulling them kind of in the field, pulling them together to be utilized, you know, in a very organized way by using sound um, or in this case tones. So you can see like the different types of um, sounds that are creating the different kinds of patterns on the plate. And these ones are really high tones. They're like up, you know, in the 4,000s, right? So you can see like the organization of these tones and how it organizes the solid matter, which it would organize the, you know, elemental world, the non-solid um, first. Okay, so we're gonna turn that off. Okay, so then I wanted to go um, and then I have a couple other um, things in here that I'm actually going to put in the links. Um, and they're the audio books of um, spiritual. Um, this is the, a book Steiner wrote in 1912, The Spiritual Beings in the Heavenly Bodies. And he talks about how all the planetary stuff works and how all those beings work. And then there's going to be another book. These are books that I'm reading right now. Um, and this book is called uh, spiritual hierarchies um, and how they work with the physical world. So I'll be putting that audio, those audio books in there as well. Okay, so now we're going to listen to, um, this is a friend of mine, Nathan Standing Bear. So Nathan um, was white, but he worked with Lakota and some other tribal people. And he learned, he did ceremonial work. He did a lot of ceremonial work here in Northern California. And when he did a lot of his ceremonies, I would go up and I would fire tend and I would carry the grandfathers for the lodge. So um, Nathan died after Standing Rock closed. He was at Standing Rock and he developed a really bad cancer that actually killed him, uh, paralyzed him and killed him. And we believe that it's because of all the things they sprayed on the people at Standing Rock. So um, this is a song 
um, when we would do ceremony together, Nathan had this, um, um, we would go there for like six days in Northern California and Grass Valley, and they were called, you know, the elemental days. And um, they were four days of intense ceremony. One was for water, one was for air, one was for earth, and one was for fire. And we would have a lot of full day of all kinds of events that would be characteristic of, you know, the element. But every morning, he was always the first one to get up. And this was always the song that he prepared us with, how he woke us up. So he would go and stand um, towards the sun as it was starting to peek over the mountain. Um, and then he would start to sing this song. And then we'd all crawl out of our tents and out of our holes. And we'd all stand in a line facing the sun and sing this song with him to activate to activate the day, right? To activate, this is a cymatic, right? This is a, this changes the energetic structure because we're communicating with the sun, the fire, we're communicating with the water, the air, the earth, and all the elementals, and we're telling them exactly how we're gonna activate and start our day. And so we'll play a little bit of this. This is Nathan when he um, did this song. The the Okay, so you can hear right in that song. Now you have the drum come in, but. So you can hear in that song how the different tones in the song and the sounds that the, the voice is making. You can also hear the certain kind of drum beat that is in that song. And you can see how this could, you know, it's a natural cymatic, which is going out and it's vibrating right solid matter water uh, the air and a lot of these things because it's a very old this is a sunrise prayer song so you do this when the sun starts to rise so that you can work with the elements right the grandfather sun in the sky which represents the fire the water the earth and and the air so this starts to in a conscious way send out a signal to everything around you of kind of what your intention is, right? You're activating everything, right, in a good way. Um, now we're gonna kind of move on. I wanted to also kind of throw in here that I've kind of really been working on a lot of, with a lot of this stuff, right, piecing it kind of together. And I know it seems kind of rough and there's rough pieces to it, but I'm really starting to understand how um, our brain, the left side of our hemisphere of our brain really is in this solid world. It's why it gets distracted like a dog, squirrel, squirrel, is because the left hemisphere can be so predominant that it deals with technical stuff, it deals with language, it deals with um, getting up in the morning, it gets, you know, the structures and patterns of things, but it's very much stuck in the past and the future, there is no present moment. And then our right hemisphere, I'm really starting to understand that it's more linked up with the dreaming consciousness, right? Where it's more about the sounds, the feelings, the smells, um, the, um, um, you know, the dreaming consciousness, right? That um, that the elemental beings are are playing with behind the background, you know? using kind of piggybacking the elements um, in the in the solid world. So 
I'm really starting to see like how significant and important it is to be in places like, you know, ceremonially, um, to really learn a lot of these songs and the different kinds of drum beats. Um, and it's more significant than that because a lot of it has to do with difficult. she is going to play bridge for the next two or three hours um if you're not busy later if you want to ride around maybe go downtown for a little bit check things out you know Hold just on. let me know if you're up to the... has a, somebody talking to him oh there we go okay so you know how we're reflecting um onto like the mineral kingdoms and um, how we're using this type of reflection and then how we're operating with it, you know, through our senses and working with the elemental beings um, in the, in the greater good by activating them in a way um, and utilizing them. All right, hold on. I have to go check something out real quick. I have no idea. Let's have a look. Okay, I don't think it has anything to do with me, so I'm going back to this. Okay, so um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, um, let me see. So we talked about the relationship between this world and the dreaming world and the elementals and why we heal, right? So in order, if for order for us to heal spontaneously, we have to be in the dreaming world working with the elementals more so than not because that is the present moment. That's where the left hemisphere is missing, right? Um, in the present moment is where the elementals are, which is a lot more in the right hemisphere. And I'd like to disclose that just because you're left-handed, because you do art, a lot of these things does not make you right hemisphere. Um, right hemisphere is mostly that dreaming consciousness. Um, where there's a lot of interaction with elementals playing through, you know, what we see as like solid, solid matter, solid, solid forms. Um, but it also has to be activated, right? There has to be an activation of that, that healing to bring forth that elemental consciousness. And this is where, you know, native people have been performing this kind of stuff for a long time and they have this communication and relationships with the elemental beings in the dreaming world um, because of all of the things that they were taught all the ceremonies the activations of these medicines and energies because that that's what they would call them you know their drums would be medicines device we would cut could call them technology we could call them technical devices i mean they are a device they are a machine because they actually can do things that a lot of our machines can't even healing machines um they can far surpass that okay so the next place that i wanted to go also you know this also creates a level of shape shifting too because like <laughs> you saw in the first video of the tones moving around the solid elements they were shifting them they were shape shifting them into different patterns so shape shifting also takes place in this um, in this stuff. So let me see where we go. So let's talk about this too really quick. I want to throw this out there. In the natural world, we have birds that are singing in different tones and frequencies. We have um, even, you know, ants marching in a line, <laughs> right? That is creating a vibration, a frequency, right? As they're all tromping along, following each other. Um, there's water and how it runs naturally over rocks and through waterways. Um, there are so many different things. There's bees. I don't know if you've ever been able, you know, say there's a, if there's ever a tree that has tons of blossoms on it and you can stand under it, especially when the bees are just waking up in the spring and they're hungry and they fill the tree with themselves and then you can feel the buzzing, the you can feel just this whole like frequency and vibration taking place, which is like, you know, 
sending out to the elementals and the dreaming world and, and bringing into balance things, right? They're like in ceremony. They're utilizing their vibrational skills, right? To help heal the earth. So I, the more we destroy the earth, the more trouble we're in. And the less that we have all of these different types of beings working together, you know, on this side in the solid way and in the dreaming world, and in the reflective way and the imprinting way and what they're what we're reflecting and imprinting onto them and what they're reflecting and imprinting back onto us matters so every footstep we take every word we say every feeling we have you know all of these different kinds of things and it's interesting because three years ago you know, when I asked Spirit that winter, you know, what am I going to be working on in the following year? They said ceremony. You're going to be working on ceremony. So that year I worked on ceremony. I worked on going to a lot of physical, more physical ceremonies. I started doing more ceremonial work myself. Um, I actually, that year, I actually got my drum um, that I have now. And um, I started, you know, participating with the environment and the and the world in a way where um <laughs> it's like all these energies are fighting against me a little bit <laughs> anyway um or they're you know maybe they're singing in, in the inclusion of it right um so then then the next year came along and i asked spirit it's the first time in my entire life that i've been on three years of ceremony so then last year they said, you're going to do ceremony again. So last year I moved into like this deeper process of, you know, really reflecting on dealing with the things in my environment that are not so positive and trying to refocus back on to. So last year I did that whole six months of energy medicine out in the, out in the wild and working with ceremonies with the plants and seeds and the flowers and, and just my whole thing, paying attention to all of that. And then this year I asked again and they said, you're going to be in ceremony again. And I can see why, because all of this information is really, really, really a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if next year I'm doing ceremony again. This year also too, people can go on my YouTube channel, but I'm also being pulled into the dreaming world where there are a lot of shaman people that are living there that are not in this world anymore. And they're preparing me for this grand ceremony. And I got a little bit sketched out about it, but it's okay. You know, it's all part of this whole, this whole walk, me becoming the best being that I can and how all of that, you know, vibrates to every avenue of the reality that I'm dealing with. Because if I can't move it forward, you know, how, how can we expect other people to get it or move it forward? Because there's just so much about it. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about, so we have a lot of sounds in nature that are already presenting this. And then we have the bad sounds, you know, airplanes that are um, hit that, um, you know, sound barrier and it's so loud can kill birds. They just drop dead. It strokes them out because it's a bad frequency that they can't handle. So right now we have very little good frequencies in nature and a lot of really negative digital, which I'm calling the digital frequencies. And we'll, we'll come into that too more when this ends because I have um, a section for that as well. Um, that really, I started to notice when I ended up doing the, um, the mapping the chart, mapping the charts when we did those three videos, there was some other significant things that I started to notice in the physical um, that has a lot to do with what we're talking, what I'm talking about today. Okay, so next place that we're going to go. Okay, somebody playing cards. No, it's just me with my Doug. She's being very much a pain here right now. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. So also, you know, things like the wit, the big trees, you know, swaying in the wind, they're creating a vibration and a humming. They're working what with the wind element, the air element and the elementals, right? They're activating things, how the leaves shift and move when the air goes through them. That's all elemental. That's all dreaming consciousness. And that's being activated um, 
And so all these different things, the physical and this dreaming aspect, you know, are actually working together. So nature is a huge component of working with the elemental beings and the elements as far as activation, which creates energy, which creates vibration, which help to heal environments. And there's different seasons that go along, you know, with this, like, you know, in the fall, you may have more wind when there's lots of leaves on the trees, but then the leaves are starting to transition more into, you know, a like a dry paper and so they start to make a different sound and then they fall onto the ground and they move with the wind you know creating a different sound and how they move across the land and then you know the leaves inevitably should be food for the microbes to actually fix the soil after they've gone through all this um, ceremony right the release of the ceremony of the tree the leaves releasing and the leaves then hitting the ground and how they move and operate and they the wind takes them, the air beings, and the elementals, and all the sounds and noises and frequencies that come from that, and then how they're drifted towards areas where they compile, and then the microbes, the earth beings, and the elementals, and the microbes, the solid, and the dreaming factors, you know, start to break them down and create nutrient, right, um, for the soil. So I start to see, like, how all this stuff is ceremonial, right? The tree, it's asleep. Then the sap, the water beings start to move through the tree. They do their part, then they move out and they create the leaves and the buds. And then the air beings and the water beings, you know, some trees like spit water out. You can stand under them in the heat of the summer and they're spitting water out, right? So these trees and the environment, so there are all these intricate ceremonies taking place within nature, right? And then the trees, as Steiner talks a lot about how birds and insects are actually moving the astral energies around. Uh, so when they're in the trees, they're communicating, they're talking, they're making sounds, they're vibrating, all of these different things. They're moving around the elementals, right? They're moving around this elemental energy that's going on. So all of these players in this are these nature natural ceremonial practices that happen seasonally, right? Um, and so really been, last year I really started paying attention to those types of ceremonies and the sounds and the energies from, you know, the wings to the their mouths and the songs and the vibrations and the trees and, and how all this stuff is working together right in constant harmony and ceremony uh, for the greater good okay so just wanted to kind of lay that out um, and then I have a couple other things so I think we're going to move into let me see what's next <laughs> all right let's see what I have next oh yeah okay so this is going to be a link okay so these are um, this is just you know um, Winnemucca stone art, Native American stone art. This, these pictures are from the oldest hydroglyphs. I've been to this area. It's two hours from where I'm at. This really started working me on cymatics and how old this kind of stuff is and how long Native people have been working with these energies and medicines. And when we were looking at that first video where these tones had these really crazy patterns, they were at these really high Hertz levels, you can see, you can see, you know, when you're looking at native stone art, you can see some of these patterns. So you've got these circle patterns here going on. You've got this other weird one. You've got a whole bunch of other ones over here. You've just got like tons of different um, patterns. This is a reoccurring pattern, which is kind of an interesting pattern. But you start to see these patterns start to show up um, on, see like this, it's showing you, you know, like even the Liburnith is a model of, you know, a cymatic frequency. And so you start to see these frequencies. I mean, you know, these are on the rock art, like I said, 
Um, this one's in Air, this one's in Oregon. This one, I think, I think this one here is actually in Hopi. But look, he's holding a drum that has the frequencies on it, the stone art. So the hydroglyphs and the petroglyphs are different. The petroglyphs are telling kind of a story, and the hydroglyphs are actually cracked into the stone. So look at this one right here. This one has a, um, a structure internally, and then it has all these branches coming off of it, which we see in the um, chimatic patterns. We also have some stuff coming on over here. And then, you know, I think a lot about crop circles. I've been really studying crop circles for the last two years. And to me, those are cymatic patterns in a lot of ways that are being laid down. And so what happens if we play that frequency? And also it's in a circle, it's in the sacred hoop, you know, usually. So there's a lot of, you know, stone art that's going on that has a lot of these frequencies. I mean, look at this guy over here. This is from Winnemucca Lake over here. And look how deep those grooves are that they put in. And that's a cymatic pattern. That's a vibrational cymatic pattern that when they put the tone onto that salt, they create. I mean, so the native people have known for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years what tones, what sounds, create what vibrations that are needed to levitate things, open up doorways, um, heal, um, bring together, um, fix, change weather patterns. A lot of these kinds of things have been going on. This isn't new. You know, sound healing is not new. <laughs> okay, so then there was another picture here. Like I said, I'll put all these um, pictures. Okay, but now we're gonna go here. There is this really cool picture here. I don't know if you can see it, but it has a Native American beading here. It looks like a medallion that you would, it, this is probably a medallion that somebody would wear on their chest from a chain. But then look at here with the Anunnaki, right here, has the same thing, right? This is an Anunnaki right here structure from the Anunnaki period which is identical to the four directional medallion that the native people bead, right? This medallion. I have a couple of these kinds of medallions that have been beaded for me and were given to me as gifts. And you're supposed to wear them on your chest. And you know, what does it do? It helps to put that frequency, you know, into your body. And the colors are significant and important. And, you know, like here you have this fringe on the outside of this beaded work. And the fringe actually is a prayer. Each, each fringe is actually a prayer. And when the wind blows it and things move it, it activates those prayers, right? It activates those vibrations. So I'm trying to give everybody like a deep understanding of all the intricate things that are going on with sound and vibration, symbols, patterns, and how they affect our world, but we have a lack of them, right? So the thing is like you could go get some sonic healing work done, but it doesn't replace you having a broader understanding of what it actually is, where it comes from, and what it does, and all the intricacies of how it could play out in our world and has with indigenous people. Okay, so now we're going to come into some more of these um, chimatic patterns, right? Like here's a salt one. Here's one that has a whole bunch of all the different kinds of shapes. There was something else on here that I thought was kind of interesting too. But anyway, I'm going to put this link up on the video and people can look more into it um, about the different types of, you know, symbols and patterns and frequencies and things like that. So let me see where we're going. I've tried to do these in order. Okay. Yay. We're at the native drum section. <laughs> okay. Can you, um, can you guys see that? Yes, I can. Is Lenny still there? I don't even know. Oh, I wonder if Lenny dropped Lenny, out. Lenny is here. Lenny okay. mic'd off because somebody came in and started talking to me. Yeah, that's okay. You're good. And, All right. Yeah, and he's here. Um, the format that you're going through stuff yeah. is not 
really working for me on a level where you're getting me anywhere different than what I already think. Right, but I'm not dead yet. And not having it be interactive like we do the collabs has had places where I would have liked to say, stop, explain this in more depth, but you blew right through it into something else. And you're building premises that I'm trying to write down notes to bring up next week when this will be old and I won't have any of it on my mind. So, right, but the thing is, the details is going to be all the videos, right? That people can actually look at those links and they Richard, can... Richard, how much time do you think people are going to spend chasing down the links? Well, the thing is, I can't really go into each link and show each video in its entirety. No, um, I know that. Right. Because no. this is, I'm basically going through three years of information in an hour and a half. Right, and you're doing a major data dump, and as somebody here on the call listening to you, you hit me with overload and didn't let me have the way of moderating what you were saying, and I put some comments in the chat, but you're busy, you're not reading the chat. Well, the thing is, I can't go into the chat when I'm screen sharing because I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually going through all my links. So I can't really go in there and see that. Cause if I go back This is not criticism of Bridget. This is trying to get something that's going to work for listeners to hear what you're saying better. And if I'm overloaded, most people might listen. Right. But the thing is, I knew people were going to be overloaded by this. This is why I said we'll have a second discussion next week about it because there was going to be so much information and the opportunity for people to chew on the information that they want and they can go down those videos on once I post it on the Think Collaborative. Right. They'll be able to look at the individual videos and let me get you back on topic. Yeah. Because I didn't intend to sidetrack the conversation. Yeah. No I'm just working on how presentations are done and thought that the immediate feedback would get us more information than losing it in my notebook. Yeah, the thing so, is that, go ahead. that this is intense because there's like, you know, 15 areas kind of, co- co- you know, coming together. Yep. And I knew that it was going to be super intense and it was going to feel a little rough, but I'm just throwing a whole bunch out there so people can chew on the rabbit hole that they want to go on. And then the links are provided for that. And then I try to give a a little bit of information for each one so that people have kind of an understanding. Okay, so I want to go back real quick to the rock art. So one of the things that happens with rock art that they put the chimatic, you know, on, we'll go back to here. Um, when you see these, you know, cymatic patterns, what happens is, is that those native people did a ceremony in the hydroglyph and then they carved out the symbol. You know, what we can ask ourselves, how did they know that symbol? That they knew exactly what that drum beat and that song and that frequency that they were projecting in that rock. Here, here in um, Reno on Thomas Creek Trail, they had a big stone that had this cymatic pattern on it. And this is long before I actually understood what it was. Um, And then three years ago, they removed it and put a sign there that said uh, that the architectural, you know, um, government architect people have removed the stone and they've put it in some warehouse for future study. And the thing is, is like, you know, we don't know exactly what the Washoe people put, put that symbol on the stone for. Was it to keep the weather and sink there? I mean, was it to keep the energies, you know, straightened out? And why did they choose that rock? Why did they choose that spot? And it was a big rock and it was open. So the wind could go through there, right? On how it rubbed onto the rock, picked up that energy field, traffic that energy field, um, people coming up to that rock and looking at it, um, 
birds landing on that rock, a lot of different things could happen with the activation of that particular cymatic frequency that was imprinted. Remember, we go back to Steiner that was imprinted from the human onto the mineral kingdom and the mineral kingdom holding that vibration. And then the symbol being the other part of how um, it would vibrate and, and interact with the outside world. Now, if these weren't weapons and they weren't power objects, then why would the government be taking them, right? So I just want to make that kind of a, kind of an, a thought. Okay, so um, my native teacher, my last native teacher, and we'll just talk about his drum. His drum was specifically designed for him. And the backing of the drum, see, because we start to look at, you know, um, we start to look at this chimatic patterning on the back of the drum. Now, the front of the drum is important. Like, you know, they're working with the elementals that are working with, you know, certain animals. We talked about how, hey, we talked about how um, animals are in the same uh, dreaming consciousness. R Rudolf Steiner talks about this as the elemental beings. Um, and so they would use the skins of the animals because it would dr bring forth the dreaming consciousness, the right hemisphere, the chimatics, the patterns, the different drum beats or tones that are activating the environments, the different kinds of ceremonies. And there are so many different drum beats, like I'm terrible at my drum comparatively to uh, other people. And so, but these beats and everything change everything. So you can see kind of like the designs uh, behind the drums. Um, my teacher, Bobado, had a specific drum that was made. It wasn't circular, it was an octagon. The wood behind it was an octagon pattern. And then it had 16 ties in the back and they were double tied 16 ties. And this would change the frequency of the drum and how the drum would actually work. And he would actually beat on it and turn it so that the ties were facing the person's head so that the frequency was moving through those ties, creating that cymatic pattern of frequency coming out of the drum. So he could use this drum to open doorways, to communicate in the dreaming world for the ceremony, the activation. And drums are used um, in native culture for everything, for harvesting the ceremonies to contact the elemental beings to let them know when a certain plant is ready. Uh, when the plant is ready, then they'll do you know a song ceremony for that, usually either their voice or the drum. And sometimes the drum and the voice is used together to create uh, more enhanced tones and frequencies, which if we go back to the first visual video we saw and the salt moving into different patterns. So every time they're changing, they're changing the actual air structure, the mineral kingdom structures, the solid world structures, uh, the dreaming world structures, the water, the air, you know, and all of these um, things around us. So this is the positive natural world healing, restoring, shape-shifting, recovering, connecting, you know, um, way of being, working with this kind of um, medicines. Um, so, you know, these machines and these people that have these, you know, machine medicines don't have anything on Native people. <laughs> So you can see like the bigger powwow drum, this would be a powwow drum where you would have, you know, like up to 10 people sitting around it drumming in unison, which is like so unbelievably difficult. Like you can't even imagine how many years it takes to be able to do that and singing in the different tones and structures um, and uh, all the different kinds of songs. So really working with a lot of the dreaming world, elemental beings. You can, you know, when Native Americans dance and they're in their, their costumes, they're not, you know, they're, those are activation tools as well. Because as they bounce and they move, everything hanging off of them is putting a tone and frequency out into nature, into the environment. They're working with the dreaming world as they're moving around in their shapes and patterns. And the dress, you know, is bouncing around all over the place. My favorite is the fancy dancers. Um, and uh, 
they um, <laughs> they're men who have these big, you know, um, their big medicines, their costume medicines on them, and they dance, and they have this one little doohickey on the top that bounces around because they're doing the medicine work with the elementals of the of the plant nation and the insect world. So they're activating energies and frequencies as they're doing the dancing and the patterning as the drum beats and the song are are going on as well. So it's a huge we can say that cymatics is much bigger than we could ever imagine and that science and people working with it with the machines and stuff know nothing really about it and no one ever wants to go talk to native people that know everything and the native people know everything but they don't want to go talk they don't want they don't want to understand things okay so we're going to do a little bit of emoto here just to you know look at let me just move it up just a little bit um, and so Emoto like said words, wrote words on things. He um, put prayers. This next series of photographs are the work of Japanese researcher Mr. Masuru Emoto from his book, The Message from Water. Mr. Emoto's work provides factual evidence that human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas, and music affect the molecular structure of water. Please remember that water comprises over 70% of a mature human body and covers the same amount on our planet. Water is the very source of all life. This photo shows the beautifully formed geometric design of the Yuji Spring water. This next photo is from the Shimanto River, the last clean spring in Japan. Notice the extraordinary geometric forms. The fact that the molecular structure of water can be affected by our consciousness, our intent, and our sounds is extremely important. This photo is from the Mount Cook Glacier in New Zealand. Mr. Moto has been visually documenting these molecular changes in water by means of his photographic techniques. He freezes droplets of water then examines them under a dark field microscope that has photographic capabilities. His work clearly demonstrates the diversity of the molecular structure of water and the effects of the environment upon the structure of the water. This photo is from the fountain in Lourdes, France. All right, so anyway, um, my last native teacher, Babado, in 2006 died. He um, got to work with Emoto. Um, Babado was uh, the caretaker of the Yellowstone caldera uh, there that people always are worried about that's going to explode and blow up. Um, and whenever it would gain pressure and it would start to grow, Bobado would go there and do whatever amount of time of ceremony was necessary in order to get it to release. So he worked with the air, the, the water, the land, uh, the earth, and also the fire, which was, you know, like the lava under, underneath, um, until the, actually he said the steam valves would open and you would watch the pressure release out of it. So Emoto heard about Babado. So then in the last years of Emoto's life, he would travel, he, Babado would contact him and say, hey, Emoto, I'm heading towards the caldera. We got a problem, you know, 9-11, 9-11.
um, we got to get there and we've got to release the pressure from it because all the elemental beings are getting ready to explode because they can't deal with the pressure. They can't deal with the pressure of the Middle East because the Middle East is directly on the other side of the planet. And all of that negativity is, you know, causing a pressure problem and it's going to make Yellowstone. This is why Yellowstone has all these problems is because, you know, it has a direct correlation to releasing all of the hostility, the violence and the anger that is currently going on in the Middle East. So Emoto would get on a plane, he would fly and he would, I never got to meet Emoto, but he did work with Babado. And he would, he and some of the people from Japan and Buddhists and all kinds of people would get on an airplane and they would come and they would help Babado. Actually, they would work only with the water and then he would work with all the other stuff and um, they would get the caldera released um, in order for the elementals and all of that kind of energy to be released so that it didn't hurt humans. So one of the things Babado used to say a lot before he passed was that we are either going to move into this next stage and we're either going to do it in a good way where we're working with all of these beings and we're working with all of these elements um, and we move forward in a really conscious way or we're going to have to do it the hard way where everything just explodes and implodes. And he even said that, you know, the earth doesn't really have to flip the magnetic pole. Um, it will because it's a mechanism to shift energy. So if we continue down the path that we're going more into this digital framework, which I'm going to talk about um, towards the end, you know, we're moving from this natural place into a, a concrete place and then into this digital place, then we're definitely, you know, the earth is going to have to flip. It's going to have to shift the energies and frequencies, but we can do this. You know, we can go back to older models in ancient ways and work together and actually work with a lot of this, um, you know, dreaming world behind the scenes and then in the physical to actually make a difference. But nature is very, very important in all of this work, right? Okay, so then we're going to go to Emoto also. Uh, one of the things that he did was he would tape words and give feelings to bottles of water. Then he would freeze them and then he would photograph the structures. These are cymatic structures, right? These little water, you know, they're putting out a frequency. So when it's froze, they're showing the frequency under a dark field microscope. Um, he played symphonies and Beethoven and, and Mozart and all kinds of things to water. And they all would always have these different kinds of structures. So it just shows that um, the vibration, even prayer um, and all of this stuff and why it matters and how we can actually move, and I hate to use light and dark, I just really hate that whole polarity, but we can use a lot of this vibrational, um, different kinds of ways and techniques to restore the elemental beings into a positive form so they don't move inside with the dark forces, right, that the dark brotherhoods, you know, work with. So, um, we either use them or lose them. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, with your health, you either use it or lose it. Um, and that's kind of like what we're dealing with. You know, it's up to us to reflect onto the environment, especially the mineral kingdoms, um, a good reflection, a good imprint, a good vibration whenever we're in it and, um, and, and trying to increase the elemental beings to help us on the other side and with us here in the solid forms. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. Oh, and then this will be a, hold on a second. Let me get rid of this volume first because I, I don't want to listen to that. Okay, but anyway, let me get this. Let me get through this. Okay, so this is, um, this is also will be a link under the video. And this is um, a Michael Tellinger video where he is talking about uh, basically, and it's looking outside of the established academic. See, he's um, talking areas here. You can see it. 
that's a chimatic pattern, right? Which, you know, people are making with machines and showing us how it looks in the solid with using tones and, and frequencies. But these are thousands and thousands and thousands of years old. And what Michael Tellinger, you can watch this, it's only like 10 minutes long once it goes up on the link. But he talks about how they were using these forms, specific stone, you know, mason forms that they were creating to actually create a frequency um, pattern in that area that they could use to levitate things. Uh, and it's in an area in Africa where there was a lot of ancient mining going on. And there were like thousands, I think there's millions of these, these different kinds of chimatic type shapes and forms uh, all over that area in Southern Africa. And it's interesting, you know, we think about why is South Africa involved in the BRICS, you know? Um, because there's a lot of, number one, ancient technology there. There's a lot of um, mineral resources that, you know, people were probably coming from other planets, I mean, you know, to actually harvest. Um, and that there's still a ton of um, elements that are still there. And in some cases, there are rare earth elements that are there that don't exist anywhere else, right? And so they were using, Michael Tellinger talks about how they were using these forms as, you know, generators, power generators, kind of similar forms, some are different, to actually generate enough power in areas where, you know, it would make things easy to mine and could actually vibrate some of these specific elements out of the ground and levitate them into the air so that they could be easily harvested, right? So um, just wanted to throw that little guy in there and he will be a link on um, the once I get the this video up and going. And like I said, there's just so much stuff that kind of goes together. Um, we also have, I already did that one. So, um, also I'm going to be putting links up. Oh wait, we're not going to do that one yet. Okay, hold on, let me go here. Okay, so I'm also going to be, I found an old documentary I watched quite a while ago. Um, it's the Chimatics full documentary, um, part one, two, three, and four. Here it goes into the healing nature of sound. Um, and so I'm going to be putting all four of those links up so that um, everybody can watch. It's two hours total. Um, people can watch the entirety of that documentary. And then let me see here. And then I'm also going to be putting the links for charting the maps. So I wanted to kind of talk about this for a minute. There was on the third... Um, charting the maps I did with Victor and Michael and we we're looking at all of the maps and they were showing like all of the star forts um, that you know were ways that they created natural energy and power uh, also gas they showed in these videos gas lines that they would have used so you know they're talking about the changing of history one of the things that became like here you can see this star fort here that would have been on a waterway so they put these star forts and so people can go back and they can watch Tarting the Maps 1, 2, and 3. It's like three hours of information. And this really got me thinking because initially some of the star forts were actually all developed in chimatic patterns, right? We've got the cymatic patterning going on here. These looks like an Emoto crystal, you know, uh, that he photographed. Um, looks like, you know, could be the backside of a drum, you know, um, with the ties and how it all ties together. Could be rock art, native rock art, hydroglyphs. So I started noticing that they had in these videos that we looked at, um, these maps that they've been saving and overlooking all of it, is that some of these star forts and the older structures, well, number one, they're always on water. So they have a relationship with vibrating the water. They have a relationship with vibrating the land and the air, right? Um, and whatever else that they're dealing with. But in the beginning, they were made, the older ones were made with trees and plants, 
And so you could see above ground the shape of them, but it, they were all in a natural structure. Then they started moving towards um, using concrete and stone, and some of them had buildings in them, which would have harvested the energy and the building would have held the energy, right? Like, so we can say that Nik Nikola Tesla wasn't the only one that had, had the information that he had. He just learned to harvest power, you know, into an object that it could be dispersed through the air or whatever else in the field into your car or whatever else but it all came from ancient technology right so the star forts would have been having um usually these star forts too have there's big what we would call churches now but we think that the churches were actually taken over and the churches had the way that the buildings were created in these forms sometimes crosses of four directions would have contained and held all of the energy. They would have been the public works. And there is um, a guy named Joseph uh, Farrell, which we talk about in these videos. And he actually talks about that that's why all of our language has to do, it's all defined by energy and power, right? And so this is why the church sits at the seat of power is because they actually were the churches were initially used to be the holders of all this energy and power that was being collected into a, a building or a solid form that could actually be dispersed out into other places in the public, right? Or not public or be utilized for whatever uh, it was being utilized for. But then you start to see what happens is that you start to go from seeing these star forts being made in all plant structures uh, in these, you know, cymatic star fort forms to more stones and even some buildings added into it. And then you start to see the digital. So then you start to see, see all these patterns around the star fort. This all reminds me of the circuit board in a computer. So they started to build from these chymatic energy collecting areas right that it were changing the energy fields um, and collecting energy from those energy fields to be utilized um, and then they started to build these roads which became like the circuit boards and structure um, that's what it looks like more to me it looks more like to me and as you look through these this, these three videos and you watch you start to see how digital it starts to look so this goes back to the thought that i was talking about earlier where we went from nature utilizing um, in a natural way and working with nature using these ancient methods and prayer and and drumming and singing and and all of these things that act and imprinting and reflecting on to um, working with the elemental beings and um, to then becoming more stone like and more solid forms uh, of controlling that energy and power um, to then having it develop into a digital form which is what all of our cities look, they look like computer circuit boards. So there's a big problem here because now they're just shifting everything to a digital form and creating something that might be like, but not is like the more ancient chymatic forms of moving energy and power around. So people can go and look at that. These you know, videos will blow your lid right off. Um, seriously, it'll blow your lid completely off. Um, and so you start to see the digital imprint. So, you know, when you have like healing machines and things like that, it's more, it's digital technology. It's not working with the nature and the elemental beings, but however, they're turning the elemental beings into working in more of a digital form, even in the dreaming world, because we're not forcing them to build natural structures which could be used for the same damn thing um, and also have the elemental beings working with you know us and the earth and the natural um, ebb and flow of how things should go so we're moving to the digital so the more they pave 
Um, and also, too, it changes the elemental beings because which will work more for the Dark Brotherhood or the forces because they don't have a home anymore. They were at one time attached to all the minerals, right, and nature and, and all of these things that are in the natural world and the water and everything else. But because we're turning it into a digital landscape, we're concreting and paving. Um, we have dirty electricity. I wrote a lot of this stuff down that, you know, um, those elemental beings are being forced through crystals and everything else causing and roadways i mean you think about how much sand is used in making concrete okay that's ele elemental be being that we've changed its form we've forced it into um, our form which makes it really difficult for it to work with us right in a very um, natural way in a in a natural world cymatic way where we could generate power and energy work together and 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 you know make sure the earth is operating well energetically and then also changing the ley lines you know, every time you reroute a river you create a dam you create these roadways and all these little digital things that you know were trees and all of these natural things used to be those were the healthy acupuncture needles. And now we have all these ley lines and all these other weird, you know, digital types of um, acupuncture needles um, that are changing the whole processes of how all of the energy actually flows, right, in a natural way. So um, let me think here. There was a... Uh, so, you know, we're going from like the nature sounds, the drums, the songs, you know, a lot of the frequencies, um, how we're reflecting, how we're imprinting onto nature and the mineral kingdoms and how they're working with us in a, in a positive way to heal and shape shift, uh, communicate, recover, you know, heal, uh, restructure energy to what's becoming digital, which is electric, electronic, plastic, machines, tones, uh, applications, digital noises, um, the computer system, you know, all of these things, uh, even the ding on your, you know, phone when you have a message is replacing, is a negative tone, right? Instead of the positive tone that would actually feel what would change so all that changes the air so wanted to tell kind of a story real quick and then I've got one last video <laughs> um, that I want to share um, but I read this book like 20 years ago and I don't remember what the book was otherwise I would actually have a link to it but it was about this monk and this monk went into the monastery when he was like four years old. And when he was around 25, he decided that he was going to leave the monastery um, because he didn't really feel like there was anything left for him like to learn. Like he felt like he'd kind of already moved through everything. So uh, he left. And what he found was that the outside world was so negatively noisy there was so much um, negative noise. There was background noise and car noise and, and footstep noises and door noises and um, refrigerator noises and, you know, um, doorbell noises and truck noises and garbage truck noises and, and, and playground noises and um, just a lot of noise. And he said that, you know, in the book, basically, he said that the what he came to that he learned in the monastery was that there was none, there was no background noise. There was no noise at all. Right. The noise, the only noise was the noise that was in your mind. And they were trained from very young age to actually learn how to step without making a sound. Right. But you could even, you learn to be able to where you could walk even fast and rapidly but it would produce no impact onto the world around you because there would be no scratching, there'd be no sound, there'd be no dragging, there'd be no tone, 
you know, stepping sound because you pulled all that back into yourself because of what you wanted to reflect to the outside world was peace and quiet and calmness, right? So they were constantly working on their reflection to the environment they were in and also to the environment with the other people. And so silence was this really important thing. And he said most difficult was his ability to actually grab a doorknob, right? And he realized like the impact of just reaching out and the force of energy that moves past your body forward quite a ways in the act of moving your arm forward and opening that door and then opening that door. And not only is there a sound that goes with it, but there's this impact from the energy field that's moving forward from your body that is moving with your intention to open that door and move forward. And so he said is for 25 years that he learned this lesson of quietness and his effect on his environment, the choice of affecting his environment and how he consciously worked for 25 years to not reflect anything harsh in, in sound or vibration to the environment at all. Um, and he didn't even realize this until he moved into the outside world and he could hear all the negative sounds and the negative impacts from all these sounds and the airplanes and everything that was going on, um, sirens and, and this and that, that actually were creating a really negative energy field and sickness, uh, not only in his body, but all the people's bodies that he was, was around. So um, I always, you know, think about that, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, how are we impacting the outside world and what kind of sounds and frequencies and vibrations, you know, are we using? Um, and nature has to be a part of this component because we're taking nature, even, even people that are, you know, in this ascension thing are taking nature out of the, and how these things are working and how we work with it in a natural way. They're taking it out because they want to have a Star Trek theme. They want to have holographic food, you know, or 3D printed food. And they want to have sound machines that are healing them. And it's only going to be temporary because if you're not eating along with nature and you're not consuming those elemental beings and you're not consuming the physical forms of microbes and nutrition and all these things are working with you inside of you and outside of you and you're not working with them in an energetic way you're going to become more like a machine you're transhumanism and i don't think that ascension people understand that they're promoting and and praying forward this ascension theme, which takes us away from actually being human and evolving in a human form and also being working with what we were given, originally given. And these, you know, Steiner also talks about how all of the animals eat our karma, right? Because they were all humans. When we all kind of started this transition to be humans, there was this collective thing that happened when there were some of the people, some of the beings that were moving towards the human evolution decided that they would take on different forms because they realized like the human was going to create so much karma or negative energy that it was going to have to actually be consumed up by the animals. So um, Steiner talks about how the birds, they eat up our intellectual karma our negative mental karma and that happens when they die so they consume it consume it and consume it to protect the environment and to make sure that it doesn't continue on so you can see that there could be a huge problem in the evolution of humans if we kill all the birds right you can see the en energy impact of that and they say that the animals that eat grasses um, you know, the four-legged grass eaters, they consume the actual physical karma that we leave on the planet. But, you know, as we kill off all the animals and we kill off all this stuff, we don't have these natural systems and programs and operating systems um, to help to um, manage the evolution of humans in a good way along with the earth and all these other beings, but you see it moving into this digital format and even 
how many people that are in this ascension process that are praying forth this ascension process because they don't want to be on this planet anymore because it's dirty and filthy and it's negative. They don't want to have any kind of responsibility for actually cleaning it up or sorting it out so we can continue the human evolution, right? To a place where we will become energetic beings, right? Full conscious energetic beings down the road. It may be like billions of years from now, but right now we're in this crux of um, if we don't change things right away um, and the ascension stuff takes forward and it's more digital, that there isn't going to be humans and we're not going to make this evolution swing, right? It's it's really an important place that we need to really reconsider of what's going on. Okay, so the last video that I'm going to show you, um, it's going to have some um, sounds in it. I'll try to cut the sound down quite a bit. Um, it's from a guy and, um, you know, people can look at the YouTube channel. The guy has put out an ebook. I tried to get this guy on my TV show in 2015, but there was just so much weirdness around it because he works out of, um, he's brilliant. He's working with cymatics and tones to actually help heal people. He has a machine called the Sono Therapy Machine. He's working out of a place here called Steamboat Hot Springs, but that's a whole other weird place. Um, I originally stopped going there in 2005 it's a church that they worship the sun in the sky, sun gazers, not the sun on the cross. Uh, so this, you know, PhD um, sound healer researcher guy works out of it. Um, I got turned on to this guy from Richard Allen Miller, but Richard Allen Miller also talked about how weird Steamboat Hot Springs in the church was. And so um, I tried to reach out to interview him and, you know, I had to go through all this weird protocol, so I never really interviewed him. Um, and the church was weird because when I was going there, I was getting these foot therapies, you know, to help heal my brain cancer uh, and get my leg to work um, from this guy that was working there that learned these foot treatments from Israel. And he had come there. He, he was the father of the daughter who was married to the priest of that church. Then they found out that the priest was cheating. He was sleeping with all the women and in, in, I'm going to call it the cult, Steamboat Hot Springs cult church. And so they, she had three children with him and then um, they needed to escape. Then the church wasn't going to allow them to take her children right with them. And so I ended up in the middle of this whole thing, trying to help them to get other places where they could work because basically, you know, it was turning out to be a very culty situation. So you know, the fact that this PhD guy works out of that system, you know, he may not be um, understand where he's doing this work at. And like I said, it's important for us to realize, like, we can do this kind of healing, working with the dreaming world in our right hemisphere in the present moment by using prayers, uh, by using, you know, ancient songs, native songs, tones and frequencies, by drumming in a positive way. We're using the right tones and frequencies um, and, and reflecting on to the elemental and mineral kingdoms and working with the earth and recovering the natural processes of it, um, you know, to help us to heal and then eating the food from, you know, a highly developed energetic place and area. So we can do this. We don't need people who have machines. Um, we don't need, you know, any of this other stuff, but we can do this ourselves and we can fix everything if we do it ourselves. So I don't want people to rely on machines, but I thought it was interesting. So we're going to go to the last video. Okay, number one that was really interesting about this video is that this guy, Gary Robert Buck, I think he's PhD, he actually spoke at a Japanese summit, this is what it says, because he, he created uh, radiation cymatic protocols using his machines and, and tones um, to help people with reducing the radiation, nuclear radiation poisoning in their bodies and actually it did work. Um, so, you know, using chimatics type work can actually vibrationally expel 
even nuclear radiation out of the body systems and the cells, which is very interesting. Um, but he did a talk uh, in Okinawa um, regarding the technology of sonotherapy, which is his therapy. He charges you to do a session on you, which we can do this ourselves, people. We can do this ourselves. During the talk, um, he created the Japanese radiation protocol. Anyway, I picked up the CD on that, but I also found that he had a YouTube channel these days. And I thought that was interesting because he says, you know, you can't, you know, he puts all, they put all this copyright stuff on this video, but they stole the song. This is a native sunrise song that they're using to show the chimatics of the song, right? And how, how it's sung and the tones and everything and what it does in a visual way also. But they say, well, you can't reproduce this and it has copyrights. It's like, but you stole, you stole the song from the native people. Did you ask them for their copyright permission? And this is where it gets complicated because, you know, we want to own things and we want to be the producer of them and we want to charge for it and we want to have all this other stuff and we never even really consider our own trespasses that this guy created this healing to show the healing ability of this song but he didn't ask the Cherokee people if he could use their song right he just trespassed right on them to show his work you know what he's got and so that he can get money so that you can go have a treatment. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to be negative about the whole thing, but you can do this stuff on your own. What kind of drum do you have? Go find an indigenous teacher, learn some songs, um, you know, learn how to do a lot of this stuff. Watch how you imprint on nature, go in, in nature and imprint on it. Uh, one of the things that I really like to do is I like to, um, go down in the summertime when I'm down collecting um, plant medicines in the wild and I'll, I'll go to the river because that's where a lot of them grow naturally and I actually do a thing where I dip into the water and I put it on my head on my forehead seven times dip into the water and I just thank the water you know I thank it I pick it up I wipe it on my forehead and I'll do that seven times and then I do my mouth and then I'll do my heart and then I think the water and then I proceed to go and look at my plants and see what needs to be collected because I think it matters because what I've been printing on that water inevitably goes through the whole water system and will inevitably go into the water systems of those plants. So I never, you know, trespass. I always ask permission. I always offer my own imprinting, my own cymatics, my prayers, my feelings. Um, gestures, you know, communicating with the elementals that are in the dreaming consciousness um, that help us with our processes here. So the, also too, let me just tell this last story because this is a story that I want to tell and then we'll show this last video and this will also be a link. But Bobado, my last teacher, he told me this story about, um, you know, he didn't, growing up in his reservation, he didn't really understand the true technology of, of the drum, even though he grew up native. And it wasn't until he was working for this mining company driving this big truck and these white guys didn't like him. And so one of the white guys who had a big truck rammed him and totally, you know, cracked, shattered the three lower vertebrae in Bobado's back. So the mining company, you know, decides that they're going to, you know, take him to, you know, the hospital. He can't walk. They have to drag him out of the vehicle and, you know, his legs don't work and, and all of that. And so they get him to the hospital and they're going to do x-rays and all this other stuff on him. And he doesn't want that kind of frequency in his body. He doesn't want an x-ray frequency going into his cells and his body. And he doesn't really like the chaos in the hospital and he just, he doesn't want to be part of it. So he calls, um, one of his friends and he says, Hey, you know, is that healer guy, you know, is that holy man guy who still does the drumming healing? Uh, is he, you know, still alive? And he's like, yeah. He said, can you come get me out of the hospital and take me to go see that guy? And so he does, his friend comes and gets him, takes him from the hospital drives him like two hours he said it was like excruciating but he didn't want any of the frequency stuff 
the vibrational stuff, nothing that the hospital had to offer. He didn't like, he wanted those people touching him. He didn't really like how any of it operated. It was bad for him. He just felt it was going to be bad and detrimental. So he goes to this holy man who uses a drum, you know, native holy man who has this drum. It's a specific, he has all these different specific drums, right? Different kinds of shapes and how they're tied in the back and different animal skins. And, and so he takes a look at Bobado and Bobado says, yeah, my back's hurt. And the holy man looks at it, has him lay down on his stomach. And then for an hour and a half, he takes a certain drum off of the shelf and then for for an hour and a half the holy man beats certain drum beats through the drum into Bobado's back that literally brought all the bones back together and healed every little fracture that was in his back because of the tones and the sounds that the holy man knew what would fix the bone, what would heal the bone, the drum that would actually create the frequency and the tones that would actually, you know, bring, vibrate all the little bones together perfectly in the exact order that they need to be and then heal them perfectly from being fractured. Bavado said that when he got up after an hour and a half, he walked out of there and he never had pain. He was completely healed and never had pain. So, if we have those kinds of abilities, why would we ever need a machine to do this kind of work? However, I want to play this last video that, you know, Mr. Buckanan, Buckan, Gary used, which is a Cherokee song to prove the point of the healing ability of his sauna therapy machine. And we're going to watch the cymatics, the pattern that this song um shows that it does so we're gonna do that hold on one second let me just make sure that it's not let me get through the all the copyright stuff here okay it's almost there hold on oh yeah so they're gonna charge us two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine if we steal this video um but they stole the song from the native people just blows me away blows me away okay let me get to the song here let's see if i can find it no nope, all the copyright okay here we go Okay, and I just want to say that those words that he used, um, the attunement to the sun, um, are words that Native people use. Those are Native people's words. So they're not just, yeah, so just...
So they're showing the kinematics of the shift of air, uh, you know, um, even the sunlight, fire, um, the water, um, air, earth, and earth, the um, consequences of the imprinting of this, this Cherokee sunrise song. We listened to Nathan's um, sunrise song from the dim people and um and how it activates like your whole day it activates everything in your environment um it's interesting they use an organ for this one but they would have used a drum right they would have beat all those drums so it would be interesting for me to see how much that would change the chimatic patterns that they're showing um of the of the patterns of the song and so it doesn't just hold one pattern it changes all these patterns and then if you added the the sound of the voices with it how much more that would have changed it but it's powerful you could see um, that they were just using the sounds and vibrations and keys and tones from this song um, and then the kind of medicine that it was producing, right? The energetic types of structures and patterns that it was putting back into the environment, working with the elements, right? And the elementals and giving them um, an, a, a reflection or an imprint of where to move the energy and how to utilize that energy. So that is it. <laughs> That is all I have. Do I still have people with me? <laughs> you got me. Yeah, I'm here, Bridget. Okay. Sorry, it was just a lot. And it took me, what, an hour and 45 minutes just to get through everything that I wrote down in the notes and all of the links. And I'm and it sorry. it seemed like only about 15 minutes. Oh. Well, what did you think, Gord? I thought it was really good. It seemed to go by like really, really quick is why I made that comment. Yeah, that's how, well, I'm glad that I got it all out. It was tough. It's tough, you know, and I can keep working on the presentation and making it better and better. No. No. no yeah, <laughs> the presentation the same just thing. fine. Working on it <laughs> will only give you incremental small advances for a lot more work. Number wise, this is great. There's, you did fine. Agreed. Yeah, well, thank you. I, um, it just, uh, yeah, it was a lot. I had a, a huge amount of work to do and things. Um, let me come out of screen share. Um, it just was a lot of stuff that over the last three years, you know, well, longer than that, because I started working with Bobado and what, um, I started working with Bobado. And Bavado, well, Bavado was kind of, uh, when I started working with Bavado, he was kind of the, um, he helped me to put all the native stuff together that I'd been working through my whole life and, and also in, in developing it all. And then, you know, now I'm working with Steiner and reading a lot of his mind-blowing stuff um and about how these beings work how we were created and it's all exactly the native stories like the the esoteric science book is all about the seven nations that first came here as vibrations and energies that created the physical world and this actually tells the story about all of it because steiner went in and um talk to all these different beings who actually told him how it all worked and was developed. And so this book is basically about the seven nations that came here um, and then the energies. It talks about how um, we were in a Saturn state, was just was the ether state, and then we were moved to the new Saturn, and then the sun came in, and that was birth from the new Saturn, and then the moon was birth from the sun, and then the earth was birth from, you know, from all of these different things, and then all of these different beings who, and energies and activations that were involved in it. So going, reading, going to, I'm going to school for Steiner stuff right now and getting more certifications, and then my teachers apply it to agriculture and nature. So everything that I'm learning and it just blows my mind because I really feel like a lot of the stuff that I've been working on 
for the last 30 years is kind of like finally starting to piece together. And then now I kind of, I'm kind of emotional, but I'm kind of being able to sort of put it out so that maybe other people can like grasp it or understand it. And even though I don't really grasp it all or understand it, right? Right now it's all like a lot of mental and some emotion, but um, it's just, I'm just trying to pull it all together so that we have a big understanding of why we should heal the environment, right? Well, realize that each of the elementals, earth, air, water, and fire, deal with everything the same as each of the other elementals in their own way. And so you can see a lot of air and fire. You can see a lot of fire and earth. You can see the water has its role everywhere. And I think that the sciences that we have in an academic environment have taught things from an absolute single perspective and then comp compartmentalized it so that the big picture that everybody gets becomes a function of that pedigree that you just talked about, where you went with Bavado and you went with Steiner and you studied other people along the way. Each time you study another person, you pull in another perspective to integrate with your individual point of view. And it, it makes total sense that each member of our group is a unity, a single human being with his own perspective on things. And now the influences within our group, within the Think Collab, are on each other and putting together observations from different human perspectives that complement what other people are thinking so that they can get to the same place with their different way of thinking. So it's not about getting them to think our way. It's about presenting information to them that can see the structure that we put it all together with. And that's kind of like why it was all rough, because I, I didn't want to give people my entirety of thoughts about it as a whole and what they should think but I wanted to give people so much different bites of different things that gives them more to think about and that they could create their own kind of ideas about all of my presentation and so it'll be really interesting to see how many people you know we have next week for the discussion and what comes out of it and I think just for me being able to present some of these thoughts and ideas um you know, I'll have this huge growth spurt, too, also by the next Sunday, you know, because is it's there, out. It's out. <laughs> is there something that you can give to the listeners who are not already in the Think Collab to get back to you, the, the Gmail address, perhaps? Yeah. So that if somebody listening to this wants to participate with us, they can be invited into the conversation? Yep. Yeah, totally. Um, they um, and all they have to do is uh, we're think collab, uh, t h i n k c o l a b at gmail dot com. So think collab at gmail dot com, and I'll put that underneath the um, um, you know the the video once I post it up to YouTube, and then with all the other links that you know that I went over. But um, yeah, it was like. Um, It, it's just so unbelievable, you know, that so many different people are working along these lines and that the Native people are the ones that really have the keys to all of it. And, you know, we practice extincting them and taking over their areas and turning it into a digital system. I mean, you know, Gord says the Native people up there look at modern building as prisons well it's not only that it's a digital system like you could see by the map it turns it into like it looks like a circuit board in a computer it's no longer human it's no longer natural and then we force these elements and elemental beings to do jobs that they don't want to do and then it creates harm to them and creates harm to us you know by taking elemental beings that are in crystals and putting them into a computer you know you're forcing them into a job 
that you didn't even number one ask permission to force them into you know um and just you know how that that's the big thing that i'm really looking at is you know natural structures to create vibrational you know because those star forts when they were first built with trees and plants and stuff you could still look down on the map and you could see the structure of the star fort right then they went to using buildings so that they can control and harness in stones and stuff um the the energies that were coming from these systems right that they were developing and then now they moved it into a digital where it's forced into a digital structure hey i have to check out it's been a pleasure to be oh yeah 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 no thanks lenny and so i will talk to you again during the week take care thanks bye (laughs) see you later lenny later gord all right, Gord. Well, I only have just a couple minutes left, and we're at the two-hour mark. <laughs> okay. Um, that book you were previously talking about, could I beg of you to put information about that book so I can look and see if I can find it? Oh, The Esoteric Science of Rudolf Steiner? Yeah. Yeah. I'll put that. Um, I'll send you a link, but I'll also add that link. Is that all I need to know to find it, Esoteric Science of Rudolf Steiner? Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is there's a link to audio. I can send you the audio link. I'd sooner have the book, to be honest. Okay. All right. Well, I'll actually put the audio link in with the the YouTube stuff because it's free. Other people may want the Yeah, audio. and then I'll send you the physical link for the esoteric science. But it really helped me. I'm only halfway through it with my class. We're on, you know, class nine, I think, coming up. Uh-huh. Um, and we're working, we're going to start on working on the earth evolution. But um, it has been, it has really helped me to understand you know teachings that a lot of my teachers gave me on how this whole thing was created um in a really defined way you know um and it just blows my mind i you know i said to my teacher Corey, i said uh i said you know is steiner around native people or indigenous people and he goes no he goes but you know we also have to think that when people really are operating from the right highest place that they're going to all connect into the same information and that's how you know the information is right right well i i I think you know with steiner and the lack of his connection to native people wasn't necessarily a handicap i think nature kind of figured out its own way to get him the information he needed yeah and or piece together you know yeah. in a um intellectual way like how how it all came about you know um and uh which has been really helpful and it's been emotional too because um you know like i know lenny was a little cranky <laughs> in the beginning because there was so much information flying at him but i warned people that it was going to be rough that there's a lot of components to this um, and I've got only a short period of time to get it all out and I didn't want to go through each piece because I didn't want people to think a certain way about it. I wanted them to consume it, go go through the links, watch all the videos and everything off the YouTube channel. Um, and do their own research and then, you know, be able to have a discussion about it the following week. And I added the discussion idea on last night because I was like, wow, this is going to be kind of way over the edge. And traditionally, you know, in my native teachers and also with my Steiner work and phenomenology, which is Goth, this, you know, Gothian, the way we study things, Gothian. Um, phenomenology they only throw out pieces <laughs> they mm-hmm. don't tell yeah. you how to think right even native people they throw out stories and pieces and then they watch you and let you kind of evolve with how you're going to understand it and how you're going to take it and that's the same thing with phenomenology you have to you have to come to your own conclusions and understanding um, so that's why it also was rough and there was so much information but it was good. Wasn't it good? Like, mm-hmm. I kept going, what can I add to this presentation? And I was like, oh, yeah, so good. <laughs> well, this is what I love about where I live. Because I, there's places in nature I can go to with Kiana, my dog, 
And um, and I say my Doug for anybody if this gets passed out feathers. <laughs> anyway, like on your wife. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so Kiana and I and we go out to these places and I get educations out there. Um, you know, you wouldn't get the education unless your reflection onto the mineral kingdoms, which are everything that exists, right? That makes the totality of nature and the elementals in the dreaming world that are working in the elements. If your reflection wasn't clear, like when you give your offering to go in there, you're setting up that whole thing as, hey, we're equals. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. You're my family. They bring you in that way. And so they have a responsibility to show you what you're reflecting on to them. When we reflect bad things, like we go into places and we trespass and we do things, bad things happen to us. Why? Because that's our reflection that we went in with. You ever come up here, Bridget? I've got a mountain. I'm going to take you to it. We're going to go camp by a little magic lake. And I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, I'm as soon as everything, you know, I'm not going to talk about it here, but, you know, as soon as everything kind of comes together, I'm definitely taking an RV and I'm going, I'm going traveling and I'm definitely coming north. I'm, I'm coming to the uh, Canuck land and I'm going to hang out and we're going to hike a lot of places. And I'm really looking forward to it, actually. There, there are beings up on that mountain that aren't recorded in any book. Well, that's the only one. That's, living the only in... one that's the only one that's in a book is in the the uh, the Stalo Historic yeah. Atlas, and it's called the Red Eyed Wolf. Right, but these are all beings, you know, that operate in the natural world systems, and that's why we need to work on our work. And, and getting back to those places with all those beings so that they're operating in a good way. They're not being extinct and they're not being forced into a digital format. Yeah, and and you, you can meet Sasquatch up there. If you're in the right state of mind, they'll, they'll show themselves to you. Yeah, how you reflect. How are you reflecting to the environment? And that's yeah. when things show up or they don't show up or they kill you. Because they don't really like your reflection, right? You're not reflecting something good. You're scaring them, and they well, don't that, like it. That, yeah, that did happen on the uh, the border peaks. There's two peaks, one on each side of the border. American took his wife and daughter up on to uh, a campground somebody had made, a picnic table up on the peak on the American side. He worked as a border guard on the American side. So I'm assuming he took a gun with him because... They didn't return when they were supposed to return. They're only supposed to be there two days, and they didn't show back up. Daughter was six years old um, at the time. Um, search party went in, and this is how they described what they found. They found both adults beaten to death in a manner that could only have been achieved if something grabbed them by the ankles and swung their bodies against the rocks and trees. Well, you know, and the only thing is, is that, you know, the more I'm understanding the brain and how we operate, the little girl was saved because she was still operating in the dream consciousness. That yeah. wouldn't have changed until she was seven. So the only, she was operating with them in a reflective way in that dream consciousness. So that's probably the only reason that she was saved. Well, I believe so, 100%. And I think the, the father being a border guard probably packed a gun with him too. Yeah, wouldn't it help their situation why I would have yeah no it's about what we're reflecting on everything and and how you know all of it is happening and I'm still working on a lot of it but but anyway I've got to run but thanks for coming and then I'll send you a link once I get it all done up well, on the think collab thank you Bridget for putting this all together and uh, I appreciate all of that that you do oh thank you I love you bye bye-bye <laughs>